بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم اللهم أعنا على ذكرك وشكرك وحسن عبادتك ويسر أعين رب العالمين إن شاء الله we continue with the life of Sufyan al-Thawri رحمه الله and what is tricky about Sufyan is that you know unlike Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak you could find a lot of events and you can uh, tell a story but with Sufyan al-Thawri is not a lot like that uh, there are certain events that happen in his life inshallah we're going to see what they are but not a lot of them that I can you know um, form it in a form of a story so that's why we have to resort to what he said rahimahullah to understand his life and who he was rather than a lot of events that took place in his life um, nonetheless inshallah that they're very beneficial and we'll see inshallah a few events that uh, tell us what he was about and the type of person he was bismillah so some of the say some of his sayings that indicate his uh, piety his manners he said rahimahullah he said la ni'matullah fi ma zawa anni min ad-dunya afdal mimma min ni'matihi fi ma a'tani he says allah's ni'ma in what he has withheld from the dunya meaning he did not give me of the dunya is greater than his ni'ma in what he has given me from the dunya meaning this dunya when you look at it it's of two types one that allah had given you and one allah that did not give you has denied you so there are things that you wish for and Allah is not going to give those to you or wish things that you don't even think about but still they're not going to come your way so he's saying there are things that Allah had given me from the dunya and things that he did not he counted the things that Allah did not give him from the dunya as a ni'mah not only equivalent to the ni'mah of the dunya that he was granted but more so and why is that? Why is that? You know, subhanAllah, and you consider it, for instance, that you wanted, I don't know, what is it? The newest car. Huh? And it's expensive. And you can't afford it. So what you can afford is a smaller, older car. So you get that. So you think about it. For a lot of us, this is a loss. You know, I wanted something great, but I could not get it wanted something, you know, flashy and new and exciting, but I didn't get it. I got something humble. and So this is a loss. This is less for us. He counting that, no, this is a ni'mah. That is the fact that Allah Azza did not give you that extra thing from the dunya is a ni'mah, is a blessing that itself needs to be thanked because you got the less part. Why is it so? Because the more that you get from the dunya, as he also said, إِذَا أَعْطَاكَ اللَّهُ مِنَ الدُّنْيَا قَالَ خُذْهَا وَمَعْهَا حِرْصَ He says that if Allah gives you anything from the dunya, He says take it and with it, greed. Or also you can say worry. That you can take anything from the dunya. But the more that Allah gives you from it and of it, what do you get in return? You want more. Right? You want more. Not less. You want more of it. And now, as we said, inshallah, you've been listening. Now, you know, you've, you, you've upped yourself to a new standard from the dunya. Uh, you are new, you're in a new bracket. So if you got a new car, or the newest car, or the flashiest car, you can't go back. Uh, unless you're a person with a strong will and a strong iman, you, can't be, you cannot be demoted. So you want something always greater and flashier and, you know, faster. So there's always that greed. I'm looking forward to something more and greater. So you're never satisfied. So you get greed with more dunya. But what also do you get with more dunya? You get worry and anxiety. Huh? So let's see, it's the same example with a new car. When do, you, when do you stop caring about your car? Whether there's a scratch or not, whether you know it's, there's a peculiar sound or not. When do you stop caring? When the car is what? It's already old, right? You don't care. I mean, you expect that sound. If there's a scratch, you say, oh, it's more beautiful now maybe, right? Because of that scratch. But if it is new, ah, you worry about it. Huh? You polish, you know, you know you, there's a dent. You don't touch it. You don't drive it. You know, so y you worry about it. Now, if it's something that is even greater, if you have more money in the bank, 
or if there's, you know, subhanAllah, uh, whatever, a profession, and you've tied yourself and your, you know, uh, worth to that profession. I am the doctor. What am I if not the lawyer? What if I'm not, what if I'm, am I if I'm not that engineer or whatever it is, that title, that office, that salary, that position? So the more that Allah gives you, then there is going to be greed and also worry. If you have less of it, you have less of the both. Less greed and less worry. Unless, you know, you're of the few and select few who don't care about the dunya even if they possess it. They could have it and they could lose it, but they still would not care about it. So he, rahimahullah, he said, Yes, Allah Azza wa Jal did not give me things from the dunya, but I'm counting that as a ni'mah. And look, subhanAllah, how sublime that could be, or how sensitive and delicate that could be, if this could be us. That Allah takes something from you, and you don't consider it to be, oh, Allah took something away, Allah gave me something. Because one thing also, subhanAllah, that, that you get more of when you get the dunya, is distraction. Right? So, this, you know, use whatever example you want to use, right? You have a new house, or you have, you know, a, a lot of money, or whatever, or a lot of investments. And not that you shouldn't. I'm not telling you not to have a big house, and not to have investments, and not to save for your retirement. I'm just telling you about a fact of this dunya, that it gives you more of it, and now you have to spend more time taking care of it. Sorry? You have to spend more time taking care of it. The house and the yard and the new car and then looking at your investments. So that takes you away from whom? Allah Azza wa Jal. Even if you are still devoted to Allah Azza wa Jal, you still have less time. Am I right? And unless your intention behind all of this is Allah, it's a distraction that at one point, at least when we meet Allah Azza wa Jal on the Day of Judgment, we will say, we wasted our time. We will say we wasted our time worrying about these things and wasting our time on these things. We wasted our time. Because it is says that, Wallahu a'lam, that the only thing that the people of Jannah or the people who are going to be entering Jannah will regret are moments that they spent without remembering Allah Azza wa That would be the only thing that they would regret. Because they know that if they had done more of this, they would get more of the rahmah of Allah Azza wa and His bounties. So when you have less of the dunya, don't think so, subhanAllah. Consider how you know, revolutionary that is to us and to the whispers of the shaitan. That less of the dunya is not less, in fact, but it is more in the sight of Allah. Right? And you know, this was something you know, that came to mind as I was talking about this. Um, the Prophet wasallam said that who are the first people to enter Jannah. Are they the rich or the poor? The poor. By how many years? 500. Huh? That's the poor will enter Jannah before the rich for with 500 years. So you consider what you're gaining versus what you're losing. And again, this is not something that where we are asking everybody to be poor. Poverty in Islam is not an objective. You, know, you don't find in the Quran and the Sunnah, Allah Azza wa or His Prophet وسلم, is telling you, be poor. Uh, that's not an objective. But rather what they're asking you is not to care about the dunya so much that it becomes your primary objective. You could be rich or you could be poor. But see the compensation. And we're saying this so that those who do not have understand the magnitude of Allah's compensation. So how long if you are poor? Let's say that you're poor your entire life. How long do you live that poverty for? For 60, 70, 80 years, right? Look at Allah's compensation. You enter Jannah and you enjoy it for how many years? 500 years before the right rich even enjoy the first, you know, drink and food in Jannah. You got it for 500 years for yourself. Huh? So consider, is it worth it or not? Just for 60, right? And some of these, I mean, 60 years, yes, I know, but some of these are your child and you don't know what's going on. You're asleep, and maybe not all of them, you're really, really poor. But anyway, if even if we suppose it's 60 or 70 or 80 years, even if we suppose it's 60, 70 or 80 years of suffering, but then Allah Azza wa gives you 500 years in Jannah just for you before everybody else, you say, well, this is, this is more than fair. This is more than fair. 
So this is Jannah, just for you, before the rich enjoy it. So if Allah takes something from the dunya away from you, it's Rahmah from Allah Azza wa Jal. And Sufyan al-Thawri, he, he used to practice, that, um, bring balance through his you know, halaqa. So he used to treat not only the rich and poor equally, he'd actually favor the poor uh, and demote the rich so that he brings balance. So he told, he told one of the people, he said, the Rajul Idnu, he says to he told to one of the people there, come closer. And he says, لو كنت, لو كنت ما أدنيتك. He says, if you were rich, I would not ask you to sit closest to me. And he said, they said also about him, he said, we have not seen uh, the powerful, uh, the politically powerful, the princes and all of that, and the rich, more demoted or more humble than they were around Sufyan al Thawri. And he did not esteem them, he did not favor them. Huh? But he would actually put them down in a way so that to show that everybody is equal. In fact, he would favor the poor people even more. And they say about him the way that he had uh, dressed or the way that he uh, looked, uh, Rahimahullah. He said, and where is that saying? It's not here or somewhere else. I do remember it, but I'm just going to look for it. Anyway. Um, now, nah. anyway. It says here that. If you were to see, if you would not know him, and if you would be walking, you know, traveling or walking, and you would not know him, and you had some money, and you wanted to donate this money and give it to a poor person, and you were looking around and you see him, you'd say that he is worthy of sadaqah, and you would give it to him. So he, rahimahullah, also was humble in his dress, was very humble in his dress. And he would receive people like that, and favor people like that. So they would say, مَا كُنَّا نَأْتِي سُفْيَانَ إِلَّا فِي خُلْقَانِ ثِيَابِنَا We would only come to Sufyan in our simplest of clothes. That's the only thing that he favors. And he respects a person when he's dressed like that. So he's not flashy and he does not respect flashiness. But it is humility. And the Prophet ﷺ said, الْبَذَاذَةُ مِنَ الْإِيمَانِ Al-badadah min al-iman. What is al-badadah? Meaning being humble in your clothing is from iman. Now, you think about it. You think about it. It's not that here in that hadith, the Prophet ﷺ is telling you, don't wear expensive clothes or don't wear clothes that you like. He's not saying this. But he's saying that at some point you will have a choice between expensive and sometimes very, very expensive branded you know, clothes that are way, way overpriced, uh, especially today. So you choice between this and wearing something humble. Hmm? Wearing something humble. And if you have that choice, and sometimes or often if you can, if your nafs allows you, because it's not a must, your nafs has to allow you, your iman has to support it. And if you choose the humbler clothing, out of obedience to Allah Azza wa Jal, and so that also you don't break the hearts of people around you when they see that you're carrying a bag that is worth what thousands of dollars and they cannot afford the next meal. If you do this for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal, this is Iman. And if you do it out of humility so that you do not grow that pride in, in your heart, that is also Iman. So not trying not to stand out. Trying not to stand out in the way that you dress. And you know one of the things that are prohibited in Islam, which is ironic in an era where everybody tries to capture attention by what they do and what they wear, is thawbu shuhra, a, a clothing that brings you fame. A clothing that brings you fame. That is so um, unique, so awkward, so different, that when you come in into a place, what do people do? Look at you. Right? Ooh, what is that? Huh? So if you're trying to attract attention and bring people's eyes to you by what you wear, color or brand or, you know, it's just so strange. It, it, cannot, it doesn't have to be sometimes even expensive, but it's just so awkward and so strange, even the color or design that you're trying to bring people's attention, that, that is what, what's behind it. And you try to bring people's attention, that's something that is prohibited in Islam. The Prophet ﷺ prohibited something like that. Because you're not supposed to bring, trying to stand out. That's fame. 
And Sufyan al-Thawri, you know, has some things to talk about fame. We've mentioned some of them, and maybe we'll mention, inshallah, some of them uh, later. Uh, his piety, examples of his piety, and some of his uh, incidents that, that demonstrated. So a woman once comes and she says, إِنِّي أُرِيدُ أَنْ أَسْأَلَكَ عَنْ شَيْءٍ فَقَالَ لَهَا أَجِي فِي الْبَابِ ثُمَّ تَكَلَّمِ مِنْ وَرَائِهِ so a woman comes and she wants to ask Sufyan al-Thawri, rahimahullah, he's, he's an imam, a sheikh, a scholar. I want to ask you a question. So he says, go behind the door, close it, and then ask the question that you want to ask. So this is his piety, rahimahullah. Where, what is this piety here? Distance huh, from the opposite sex. So even though he's a alim and he can say yes, you know, talk and whatever, but he, rahimahullah, radiyallahu anhu, wanted to preserve... Huh? With the purity of that exchange. So if, if I'm close to you and you're close to me, subhanAllah, even if the intention, the beginning of that intention is for Allah Azza wa you do not guarantee what happens in the next minute, what happens next five minutes or after ten minutes and after we keep, you keep talking. So he says, if you keep a distance where I cannot see you and you cannot see me and we are, we are you know, not close to each other, then there would likely that the shaitan is not going to be in the middle, bi'ilnillah azza wa Of course, you know, you now don't want to be alone. You don't want to be alone with a sister. You don't want to be alone or for the sisters with a brother. You don't want to do this. Even, you know, if you're just asking a question, a religious question. You don't want to do that. Because if you there is khalwa, if there is, in a sense, you're alone, who is the third? There is the shaitan, definitely. So you only want to, always you want to be, bring a third person who is around, who hears what you guys are saying. But here, he, rahimahullah, is saying, you know, no. If you want purity, okay, distance, distance, so that there is no uh, room for the shaitan to enter and then corrupt your heart and corrupt her heart. Uh, someone says, has this incident to uh, tell about Sufyan al thawri He says, he says, I've sat next to Sufyan and he was reclining and his back was against the Kaaba. And I gave him salam, or he was actually reclining, he was um, lying down, but he was right next to the Kaaba, and I gave him salam. And he gave me sort of a wee, very weak salam. And then I told him, your sister has sent something to you with me. And then he sat up, and then he has energy again. And he, I told him, oh Abu Abdullah, you know, I gave you a salam, and you didn't give me like a proper reply. And I'm telling you that I brought something for you, and now you have energy and you're excited. So he told him, he says, I did not eat a thing for three days. And when you told me that she brought, you brought something from my sister, I know that she had brought me food. Uh, she had brought me food. She had sent food for me from spinning that yarn. Uh, so she, and I said, remember that his mother used to do that? And she said, I'm going to support you by spinning yarn. So that transferred to his sister, rahimahullah. So also she, from time to time, she would send something to him. So he was so weak, out of hunger, that he, you know, he couldn't give a proper salam. So he gave him salam, he couldn't. But then when he realized something is coming, that's food, he had energy and then he sat up and then he started to eat. So it tells you about what he had to go through. And yet, if you remember, that he said in the beginning, or last time when we said, he said, I asked Allah Azza wa Jal for support, I asked Allah to provide for me. I've always seen the best. So he counts this incident also as the best. Because he stayed hungry like that out of choice. He could have accepted gifts. Gifts from a Khalifa, gifts from a prince, gifts from powerful people, gifts from the rich. But he, rahimahullah, would deny and reject all of them. Deny. Why would he do that? Because he says, I do, wanna, do not want to humiliate myself to anybody. Once a person gives you, they control you. Hmm? Once a person gives you, they have control over you. They can dictate what you can do. And of course, and especially in his case, why he stayed away from the powerful. The reason why he did this uh, the Khalifa so-and-so, Prince so-and-so. He says, you know, if I accept their gifts, I will not be able to stand up to them and say, this is wrong and this is right. If I accept their invitation, he said, subhanAllah, something that is interesting. 
It tells you about the human heart. He says, if I see, if I just meet someone in the, uh, they're walking, you know, on the street, and if I have something in my heart against him, even sometimes legitimately, but he says, smiles in my face, and he says, Assalamu alaikum, and how are you doing? My heart softens. So what do you think is going to happen to me if I accept their invitation and I eat their food? What's going to happen to my heart? So if they are unjust and they're committing injustice and I accept gifts from them, how will my heart be pure enough for it to keep telling them this is right and this is wrong? So he says you keep your distance from them. That's why he used to deny a lot of gifts from people and all and be very strict in what is halal and what is haram. And that is, it is for that reason that he lived a lot of his life, rahimahullah, without a lot of money. Now, uh, um, some sayings and you know, incidents that explain his uh, humility. Once he was, rahimahullah, he was in Mecca, and a lot of people were around him. They want to learn from him, write you know, the hadith that he has, so what does he say about himself? He says, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. He says, you know, inna, you know what that means. Akhafu an yakoon Allahu qad dayya'a hadihi al-umma haythu ahtaja al-nasu ila mithli. I'm afraid that Allah Azza wa Jal had sent this umma into loss when they started needing someone like me. Yeah? That if he, he, he says, I know who I am, and in his eye, he's small. Right? And this is how you're supposed to be in your own eye, not big and great, but small. Yeah. So he is saying, he says, Subhanallah, what is happening to this ummah that they need somebody like me? So Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, one of the reasons that Allah, you know, he was elevated in the eyes of the scholars and the masses alike is that he was humble. And if a person is not humble, he does not receive that station. Once Ibrahim ibn Adham, sent to him, and Ibrahim ibn Atam is a worshipper, he's not a scholar, but he's a worshipper of Allah, he's a abid, he's a zahid. He sent to him and he says, Ta'ala hadithna, he says, come to us and teach us, give us hadith. So they asked Ibrahim ibn Atam, they say, he, you sent to him a message like that? Like how could you send to him a message like that? If you want to understand what it is, think of a alim, a big alim today. It doesn't, you know, whoever you know. And you sending him, or somebody below his rank, sending him a message, come, come and teach us. Uh, rather than you go to him, because the standard is what? They come to you, you go to them. Huh? You go to them. Uh, you don't call them and they come to you. It's not a delivery. Come and teach me. Uh, you go to them and they have to give you time. They have to give you time. You have to beg for it. Good old days, right? When you have to beg for knowledge. Please teach me. And they have to agree and see what kind of student you were. You know, it wasn't like free, you know. It's free, it's free, but yeah, and it's like it, it, had, it, it had standards. Ala says, why are you doing this? He says, I wanted to test his humility. So he came to them and he taught them. He came and he taught them. This is, subhanAllah, compare this to him and others. Who the Khalifa uh, would say, come and teach us. Come and teach my kids. He says, no. Knowledge, you come to it, it doesn't come to you. The Khalifa and his children, right? For some of the ulama, they say, come and teach my children. Come and teach us in our court. He says, no. You come to it, it doesn't come to you. So here with the, with the Khulafa, uh, with the Khulafa, they expressed and they needed to express the di and emphasize the dignity of knowledge. But here, it is for the sake of humility that he would do this, rahimahullah. As somebody says, once I saw him in the marketplace and he was sitting and eating. Meaning that's, that's an example of humility. In the marketplace, right there, right there sitting and eating. And I saw him in Sun'a, in Yemen. He was sitting next to a boy and he was teaching him and the boy is writing. You know, his hadith. Just a boy, just a lad. So that's also a sign of humility. And that reminds you of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa Wasallam. In a sense, you know, one example of his humility that they talk about is that a little girl, if she wants anything from him, she can hold his hand and take him and drag him Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Not reluctantly, but take him and lead him Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam until she reaches, I want this, I want that, whatever. And then he will do that for her and then until she lets go of his hand. 
So a little girl, can she do that to the Prophet Wasallam? And imagine again, he's a leader, not only a Prophet of Allah Azza wa Jal, who, you know, went up there and spoke to Allah, right? Yeah, right? If I, if I go to speak to someone important in this life, khalas, after this, I mean, no one else can talk to me. Because huh? I'm important right now. But he, after he spoke to Allah Azza wa he spoke to him and he had a conversation with him. Yet that did not stop him from listening to the simplest and the weakest of people. So this is an example of it. And he said also about him, Rahimallah, ma ra'aytuhu jalisan fi sadri majlisin qat inna ma yaqudu ila janibi al-ha'iti wa yajma'u bayna rukbatayn. He said, I've never seen him sitting in the middle of a halaqa. In the middle where everybody is around him. He sits and thus on the side, and he holds his knees together with his hand. And that is a humble posture. So like, like what you were doing, right? I'm sorry, putting you on the spot, but you, we were doing it anyway. So the way that he's sitting here. So that's a humble posture that also the Prophet ﷺ used at times to sit like that. So very humble. I'm sorry, you, you, you know what I'm talking about, right? You just put your knees next to your uh, chest and you hold them with your... Uh, hands. So he He says, so this is a humble posture that also the Prophet وسلم, used to used to do. So he was humble in his life, rahimahullah. And and this is also uh, it's beautiful here. He says, كان إذا قيل له أنه رؤي في المنام يقول أنا أعرف بنفسي من أصحاب المنامات. He says when people come to him and they say, we have seen a good dream about you. Hmm? A good dream about you or dreams about you, not one. We've seen good dreams about you. What did he say? He says, I know myself better than those people who are seeing these dreams. So he wouldn't take them. Yeah, and if, for instance, if somebody comes, I don't know, it doesn't happen that often. I don't know if it happened to you, share that with me. But if somebody, you don't have to share that with me. But if you, somebody comes and tells you, uh, oh, I've seen you and you know, mashallah, you were in Jannah and whatever, I have seen you and the Prophet ﷺ was praising you or I've seen you, these kinds of dreams that we're talking about. Huh? These like great, great dreams. Like if, you see, like if somebody just once comes with a dream like that to you, you say, that's it, that's it, alhamdulillah, that's the, the thing I was waiting for. Um, they've seen a lot of dreams like that about him, for him, during his life and after his death. Rahimallah. But during his life, what was beautiful about him is that he was knowledgeable enough and wise enough to know that these should not tempt you, these dreams. Because first of all, Allahu A'lam, you don't know, the person who has seen it, did he see an actual ru'ya or not? Second of all, is this a fitna for me or not? Am I going to take this and say to myself, so and so saw that I'm in Jannah, I am in Jannah? And so what he said was very meaningful. He said, I know myself. I don't deserve this. I know my sins. I know my shortcomings. I know all of this. So I'm not going to be tempted and deceived by it. So he didn't pay attention to them. And this is something, you know, a good strategy that you have. If you, if you see a dream, somebody sees it for you or you see it, and there is rahmah in it and bushra and good news. Thank Allah Azza wa Jal for it, that it is there, but don't rely on it. If you see yourself in Jannah or, you know, I don't know, uh, you, you've been forgiven or whatever it is, thank Allah for it. But don't rely on it thinking I have to stop working, I have to stop worshipping because now I've been guaranteed something. Don't rely on it. And know your sins and go back to your sins and ask Allah Azza wa Jal for forgiveness. Um, now this is the one that I wanted to say. It's right here. No problem. Okay. Um, he says also, Rahimahullah, and this is part of his uh, taqwa, humility, and um, desire not to be known. He says, لو وددت أن يدي قطعت من إبطي وإني لم أشهر ولم أعرف بهذا الأمر كنت أكون رجلا من العرب من صالح قوم قد قرأت القرآن. He says, I wish that my hand was cut. I've lost my hand, rather than I'd be known and famous as I'm known and famous today. I wish that I would be just a regular person, right, from among the Arabs or from among people, a righteous person who is just there sitting and reading the Quran. So he has achieved. A degree, a good degree of fame, rahimahullah. And of course, um, fame brings with it a price. Uh, brings with it a price. So, 
one of it, one of the things that it brings is that you would like to be known. And one thing also that it brings is that you start saying things to place people. Because fame is built on what? What is it built on? People's approval. And if you are, they don't like you anymore, you're not famous anymore, you become infamous, the opposite of it. So if you want to continue to be famous, you have to keep pleasing. Huh? So one, that, that's, the, that's the price that fame brings. So loving it, it, it is, a, is a problem. And wanting to be known is a problem. And trying to maintain it is a problem. So he, rahimahullah, was so genuine. Because they say, ما صدق الله أو ما أخلص الله من أحب الشهرة. Which is a very difficult saying. He says, one, one who, is, who loves fame is not sincere. Or one who loves fame is not honest with Allah Azza wa Because if you're sincere and honest with Allah, you would do things for the sake of Allah, not for the sake of recognition and being known. But if you do it for that, then you're not doing it for Allah Azza wa So that's one thing that he, rahimahullah, had said. And maybe there are some other sayings like that. Inshallah, we'll see if we come to them or not. Now, it, rather than accept money from people, uh, gifts, not, not, not sadaqah, but gifts from people, rather than that, he, what he would do when he wanted to travel, one of the day, or t- day, things that he did when he wanted to travel, is that he put himself for hire. He's, a, he's on a trip, whether it's a trip for Hajj or a trip like that, he had put for self, himself for hire. So there were a caravan and there were a camel, uh, herding camels. So he hired himself. He says, you know, employ me. And they don't know him. He says, employ me. So the, they asked him, he says, bake some uh, or make some bread for us. So he went and he made some bread. But is he an expert in making bread? <laughs> He's not an expert in making bread. So he made bread, but the bread was bad. So the guy, he tasted the bread. What is this? And he hid it. Right? He hid it. So when they came to Mecca, you know, that, you know, the, uh, that guy came into Al-Masjid Al-Haram. Al-Masjid Al-Haram, huh? imagine now, I want you to imagine Al-Masjid Al-Haram. Going into the Kaaba, you know, the, around it and whatever. And then Sufyan comes in. And of course, when Sufyan comes in, what happens? Ah, crowds. The crowds, you know. Sufyan, Sufyan, come. And they're surrounding Sufyan. And then he was looking at what's, what's happening. Who is this guy? So he asked the question. He says, who is this? He says, this is Sufyan with Thawri. And he got depressed when he heard that. You know, he didn't know that this is Sufi- he was hiring Sufyan with Thawri. And he struck Sufyan with Thawri. So it was, it was very hard for, on him that he did this. So when everybody dispersed and they were done with Sufyan and they did not need anything from him, rahimahullah, he says, Ya Abu Abdullah, I did not know you. He says, that is fine. The one who does not make good food deserves that treatment. All right? So meaning that, subhanAllah, was he angry? <laughs> and he didn't tell him, you know who I am? SubhanAllah, because it gets into your head. Wallahi, it gets into your head. Do you know who I am? Do you know how many people just are waiting to just write words that come out of my mouth just for me to judge this hadith and this hadith, asking me fifth questions that decide their life? You understand what it is? It decides the rest of their life. Oh yeah, you're not married anymore. Oh, you cannot marry this. Oh, this is your... These, these types of, you know, very serious questions. Do you know who I am? But he wasn't angry with him and he just let it go. So this is when yourself, you know, is not so great in your eye, and you, subhanAllah, and it's, and it's so, um, and it's, it becomes easy for you to forgive others, because, because it's not great in your eye, but what is great is forgiveness of others. Um, now. Now. He, rahimahullah, also has, um, um, saying, he says something like, he says, إِنِّي لَأَفْرَحُ إِذَا جَاءَ اللَّيْهِ لِيَسْتَرِيحَ مِنْ رُؤْيَةِ النَّاسِ He says, Rahimullah, he says, I'm happy when night falls, because it you know, brings me relief from seeing people. Right? And of course, you know, Wallahu A'lam, he is saying this, because what happens at night for him is solitude. And his solitude, of course, he's not, well, he's not saying, you know, I'm happy that night comes because I could sleep, right? I could finally sleep. He's not saying because I could sleep. He's saying because I could do what? Because I could be alone with Allah Azza wa Jal. And that is the sweetest time that he had. So although the time that he had spent with people, he's teaching and all of this, 
But still, there is, there is burden. When, whenever you are around people, there is a certain you know, degree of burden. But the sweetest time that you can spend and the least burden that you would have is when you are alone with Allah Azza wa and you're talking to Him and you're reading His book. He says one of his sayings he uh, has, rahimahullah, and he tells you, for instance, about you know, his, his assessment of people and how he wanted to always remain independent as much as he can. He says, إِرْغَبْ إِلَى اللَّهِ فِي حَوَائِجِكَ لَدَيْهِ وَفْرَاقْ إِلَيْهِ فِي مَا يَنُوءُ بِكَ وَعَلَيْكَ بِالْإِسْتِغْنَاءِ عَنِ النَّاسِ وَارْفَعْ حَوَائِجَكَ إِلَى مَنْ لَا تَعْضُمُ الْحَوَائِجُ عِنْدَهِ And there's a continuation of it, I'll, I'll tell you what it is. He says that, when you want something, go to Allah Azza wa Jal and ask Him and ask Him exclusively. And if something is heavy and is burdening you, give that to Allah Azza wa Jal. And be independent of people, do not ask them. Do not ask them for any help as much as you can and as much as you can just rely on Allah Azza wa Jal and then yourself without their help and aid, continue to do this and don't need anybody else. Because ask Allah Azza wa Jal because there is no need that is too great for Allah. Uh, there is no trouble that Allah Azza wa Jal cannot take away. So why do you need to ask anybody else? And he says... And then he says, he says, for Wallahi, he says, Wallahi, I do not know of anyone in Al Kufa, in this city that of his. If I go to borrow from him, Ashratu Darahim, like something like ten dollars, huh? he will give it to me. But then he will go and tell people, you know what, Sufyan came and asked me and I gave him. So he's talking here about the minna. The minna meaning the favor that a person will have. And will remind you of it. And some people, subhanAllah, some of us have that, you know, disease in us, right? And Allah Azza wa says in the Quran, لا تبتلوا صدقاتكم بالمن والأذى Do not spoil your sadaqah with men and other by hurting people or also reminding them of your sadaqah. Because that will be the reward that you're getting for it rather than the reward that you are waiting for from Allah Azza wa Jal. Meaning, remember the time that I uh, lent you a hundred dollars? You tell a person. Remember when I helped you before? Huh? Remember, you know, when, when you remind a person with your favors, what happens with uh, the reward of that act you act, act did? It goes away. You spoil it. So you're supposed to do something and leave it. لا تبطلوا صدقاتكم بالمني والأذى So here he is talking, rahimahullah, about that man. That if I go and borrow something from someone, he'd always, not only that, he would tell people that what has happened, but will always remind me, oh, I've given this to you. And he'll have an upper hand. He says, I don't want that to happen. As much as you can, remain independent. And if you need something, give that to Allah Azza wa Jal. Don't give it to people. And then he also says, Rahimahullah, and this is, I think, you know, beautiful. And again, tells you about his assessment of people, his, as his wisdom in dealing with people and how much he understands them. He says, Ishab man shi'ta, thumma aghdibhu, thumma dussa ilayhi man yas'aluhu anka. He says, keep the companionship of anyone that you want, and then make him angry, and then sneak someone to him without him knowing, sneak someone to him and let him ask about you. Then you'll know who that person is. You follow? Yeah. That is, as long as we're happy and we're friends and everything, and you know, we're fine. We were fine. And if somebody asks you about me, or I, I, it asks you about me, or me about you, we'll only say beautiful, good things. Now, if we get angry with each other, for whatever reason that is, what are you going to say about me? And what am I going to say about you? That's when you discover who your brother and sister are. This is when you discover who this person is really made out of. Is he a person of taqwa or not? Is he a person of wisdom or not? Under stress, when you're angry, when you know about the person's fault, right? when you know about the person's fault and yet you conceal it. Like with someone, he had a problem with his wife. Like not somebody I know, it's like just something I read in books. 
He had a problem with his wife. Somebody came to ask him, he says, what, what, what seems the problem between you and your wife? He says, this is my wife. How can, how can I share anything with you? Are you? Then he got to divorce her. Then a person came to ask him, oh, what happened between you and why would... And he says, she's not my wife anymore. How I can talk about a foreign woman like that? Either way, he concealed it. Not like, oh, what is happening with so-and-so, and then you just open the floodgates. This is what is wrong with her, and this, and this, and this, or for the sister. This is what is wrong with him, and this, and this, and this. Meaning just complaint and sharing information for no good reason. If you're sharing information with a wise person, reliable person, seeking solutions and help, that's okay. That's okay, that's fine, inshallah. But if you're just sharing it for the sake of what... Uh, publicizing a person's fault and because that's going to make you feel better, that's not okay. So what type of brother or sister are you? It really shows when you're upset with someone, when they make you upset, when, when you're angry, when you have a reason to divulge their secrets, but you don't. Speak bad about them, but you don't. But as long as everything is fine, that's not really a measure of somebody's character. Now, uh, okay. now this is the, uh, some sayings or some examples of his fear of Allah Azza wa Jal and his, how much he cried. Um, he says, this one person, he says, I took permission to go and visit Sufyan in his home from his wife. So I went in and I found Sufyan at Thawri during noontime. And he's saying, Am anna la nasma He says, do they think or perceive that we do not hear their secret talk, sirrahum, meaning their internal talk or their thoughts, and najwahum, their private speech. And then he is saying, yes, or, yes, ya Rabb, yes, ya Rabb. And he is sitting there and he's crying and he's looking at the ceiling. And he's, you know, he's crying and his, you know, uh, tears are running down his cheek. And I was sitting there. And I continued to sit for, you know, an extended time. And then he looked at me and he says, how long have you been here? Right? How long have you been here? And this is common with him, rahimahullah, that he would be, subhanAllah, you know, in, with so much focus, that he wouldn't notice what is happening around him, where a person came or a person left, or something like that. Like, for instance, he says, and it's somewhere here. Okay. Okay, again, technical problems. Anyway. So he says uh, somewhere here, it says that uh, a person brought him, this was after Isha. So he brought him um, the wudu so that he would, you know, um, you know, make wudu and, you know, do this or do that. And he, rahimahullah, was sitting and he was thinking. So the person went, you know, and, and the wudu, you know, container is in his hand. So he went, rahimahullah. I mean, that, that person who gave it to him, he went to sleep. Then he woke up, and Sufyan Thawri is still sitting in his position, right, with that container in his hand, and it's close to Fajr time. So he came to him and he said, you know, can I take from this from you? Are you done? And he said, what? You know, what has happened here? He says, okay, don't tell anybody about this. So he continued to sit just like that. And he says, you know, you're thinking about the hereafter, rahimahullah, from the beginning, after Isha till all the way to Fajr time. And he's just contemplating the verses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just like this verse that we mentioned here. Is it do they think or do they perceive that we do not hear, know about their thoughts or their private speech? Now when you read this, you know, you think to yourself, subhanAllah, we like something common. Oh, okay, just a, a verse that I'm gonna read. But when you really think about it, and that you may be standing before Allah Azza wa Jal, and Allah knows all your thoughts, the good ones, wonderful, but the bad ones, and any private conversation or secret speech that you had that was not pleasing to Allah Azza wa Jal. So then, if you think about it, and how embarrassed you may be before Allah Azza wa Jal, when Allah asks you this question, did you not know 
that I heard you when you were saying this, and I saw you when you were doing that, and how embarrassed you will be, and that you do not have an answer, then that becomes a verse that could cause a person at least to worry, if not to cry. And maybe also in addition to crying, that a person will, what? Start thinking about this verse, and it becomes something that, subhanAllah, that brings him back to Allah Azza wa Jal. Um, and that is the beauty of the Qur'an, is that the more that you think about it, the more that it will give you. So someone came to uh, Abdullah ibn Mubarak, going to Abdullah ibn Mubarak, and they, he said, I read the entire Qur'an yesterday in Raqqa. Right? I read the entire Qur'an last night in Raqqa. Right? So he says, but I know a person who yesterday started reading Al-Hakum Al-Takathur and did not finish it. Right? So he's telling him also, and he, he it says they mean, or he's referring to himself, but he did not uh, uh, and it divulge that. So he's saying, I know a person who read Al-Hakum Al-Takathur but could not finish it. Because when you know, when you understand what Allah Azza wa is saying in these ayat, they will, they will stop you and they will shake you. So, of course, there are different readings of the Qur'an where you can read the Qur'an for memorization, you can read the Qur'an because you just want to finish, but also you could read and you should read and we should read the Qur'an so that you know, we, we get something really from these ayat. He, said, he says, the one who sees Sufyan, he would see him or he would suppose as if he's on a ship that is about to sink and he's afraid of drowning. And he'd be as if he is actually uh, um, afraid of drowning and he would say, Ya Rabbi, Sallim, Sallim. He says, Ya Allah, safety, safety. Safety, safety. And this is another, there's another saying from another uh, scholar, Rahimahullah. He says, your dua should be like that. Your dua should be like the dua of the drowning person. How does a drowning person make dua? You can do that. But I'm saying, what, what, how, how devoted is he? Uh, to that dua. That's the only thing you think about when you're drowning and you're asking Allah Azza wa you ask Him with all of your heart, uh, with all of your senses. You ask Him that mas'ala, the dua, the request of a desperate person. Desperate. Who knows that only Allah can help him and no one else. And if Allah does not help him, he dies, he perishes. That's how you should ask Allah Azza wa Because when you ask Allah, who is the one who answers the dua of the needy when he calls on him? Allah Azza wa Jal. So you need to ask him like you really are in need. And the more that you are like that, like the brother reminded us, La ilaha illa anta subhanaka inni kuntu min al When the Prophet of Allah Yunus alayhi salam asked Allah Azza wa Jal, and he was completely reliant upon him and no one else because he knew that no one else can help this is when Allah Azza wa accepts the dua. So our dua sometimes could be weak because we still have, or our heart still trusts other people, or trusts ourselves, or trusts what we can do. But when your heart only trusts Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is when your dua is the strongest dua. And this is when Allah Azza wa Jal is most likely to accept your dua because now it is completely submissive to Him, has surrendered to Him. And you know, he would also say, Rahimahullah, fi majlisin sallim sallim afwaka afwak, sallim sallim, yani ya Allah, safety, safety, afwaka afwak, your forgiveness, your forgiveness. And he also said, Rahimahullah, I wish that I would die when I die, and I do not get any rewards or any sins from my hadith, from my seeking the hadith. Law anni anfalitu min hadha al amr, la liya wa la alay. That I would, if would I die, I don't want any good deeds, but also not any sins from this hadith. I wish that I would actually get this. Because he was afraid, rahimahullah. Yeah, I'm sitting and teaching. But is this for Allah? I'm sitting and recording hadith, but is this for Allah Azza wa Jal? And subhanallah, his taqwa was to the extent that, if his fear of Allah was to the extent that, when he died, before his death, he says, bury all my books with me. My books? He says, I, I, don't, I don't know if I have a good intention when I wrote all this. Bury all of them with me. Right? And he just allowed a little bit of it to be saved. And the rest, he says, just bury it with me. Right? So some, there are some ulama who have done that. 
because he wasn't sure about his intention. Was this for Allah or not? And this reminds you of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, who said something like this, you know, uh, close to his death, about the khilafah. And وَلَدْتُ لَوْ أَنِّي خَرَجْتُ مِنْ هَذَا لَا لِيَ وَلَا عَلَيَ أو كَمَا قَالْ شِيئًا مِنْ هَذَا يَنْ He says, I wish that when I die, I come out of it not having anything for me or against me. I'd be happy with that. Because he was afraid to be questioned by Allah Azza wa Jal of what did you do with this position? What did you do about so and so? What did you do about such and such problem? So it's a huge responsibility. So this is the people who have taqwa of Allah Azza wa Jal. They would fear even when they do something good, they would fear Allah Azza wa Jal. Was this something that Allah has accepted or not? No. And it says here about reading the Quran, he says he uh, prayed once in Maghrib. So when he came to Iyaka Na'budu wa Iyaka Nasta'id, he started crying and crying and crying. And then he had to go back and read it from the beginning. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. So even reading Al Fatiha, subhanAllah, when a person really knows what they are reading, can you know cause a person to cry, subhanAllah. Um, he says this is about his worship and some of the routine that he had. He says, I had not dealt with anything that was more rebellious or harder on me than my nafs, my soul. It keeps changing on me. So your soul or your nafs is like that. You're not going to really deal with something more stubborn than your own self or your own soul. And some more something un, you know, unmanageable than that. Because in the beginning of one day, you're great. Right? You're great and you want to pray and you want to fast and you want to do good things. Tomorrow, your soul is tired and bored and doesn't want to do this anymore. You begin an act and there is ikhlas in it. You have, you're, you're sincere. But then somebody comes and says a word here or a word there and then you begin to do it for them and not for Allah Azza wa Jal. Um, or they come and they, don't, they criticize you and they don't want to stop and they don't want to do it anymore. So this self is so rebellious and also unpredictable. That he says, this is, was the hardest thing to deal with. مَا عَرَجْتُ شَيْئًا أَشَدُّ مِنْ هَذَا And if this is something that is hard to deal with, it means that we really need to pay careful attention to it and ask Allah Azza wa Jal to help us with it. اللَّهُمَّا عِنِّي عَلَى ذِكْرِكَ وَشُكْرِكَ وَحُسْنِ عِبَادَتِكَ That's why, that's why the Prophet ﷺ told Mu'ad رضي الله عنه, Ya Mu'ad, I love you, don't leave. Ever after the salah, each salah that you say, Allahumma inni ala dhikrika wa shukrika ya wa husni ibadatika. Ya Allah, help me to remember you, to worship you, dhikrika, uh, to thank you and to worship you well with ihsan. Because if Allah does not assist you and does not help you, you do not have the power or the desire to pray. You don't, don't have it because you and I are great somehow. Alhamdulillah from Allah, this is a ni'mah from Allah. It's not because we're great, because Allah assisted you. Uh, maybe you've done something good in your life yesterday, this morning, that Allah Azza wa wanted to reward you for, and He had given you the salah. But it's only because of this. And if not, if Allah Azza wa decides that He's going to abandon you, He's not going to give it to you, once you think to yourself that I'm great and I can do it on my own, He says, go do it on your own. Uh, you stop your salah, you stop your ibadah, you become miserable. Because you, you, you abandon Allah Azza wa so Allah abandoned you. So no, go back to Allah and know that you're only doing the good things that you're doing because of Allah Azza wa and then because of other good things that you have done. And if you do something bad, you won't be able. You won't be able. So like even Sufyan al-Thawri and others have said, he says, you know, حُرِمْتُ قِيَامَ اللَّيْلِ خَمْسَ أَشْهُرِ بِسَبَبِ ذَنْبٍ أَصَبْتُهُ He says, I've been denied night prayer five months because of a sin I've done. I couldn't. If you find it sometimes it's hard to wake up for the salah, it's hard you miss it, and consider, okay, in addition to the fact of considering the means, maybe you didn't put you know alarm on, you need you know somebody to wake you up, somebody to encourage you and all of this, but still consider, are you doing something wrong that is weighing you down? Where it's not releasing you unto the worship of Allah Azza wa Jalla, so it's just keeping you back. So if you leave these sins, if we leave these sins, ta'a, worship becomes easy or easier. So they keep us back. 
So consider these sins because they keep a person back. And the more that you do of the ibadah of Allah Azza wa Jal, the easier that it gets. And he had, subhanAllah, you know, Sufyan al Thawri liked good food. He liked to eat yani, good, good food. And so there is nothing wrong with it. And one of the people that they cite as there is really nothing wrong with eating or liking good food is Sufyan. He used to eat well, but not just eat and that's it. So subhanAllah, see what he said here. He said, they gave him good food. They describe it. He ate this and they gave him raisins, delicious raisins and this and that. And then he said, he said, when you give a donkey more food, you expect more work from him. Right? <laughs> right? So he stood up and he started praying more. So he's giving you know, an example of an animal. He says, when you give animal more food, it means that you have more energy. Now you can do more. I've eaten well. I've got to do something with this extra calories that I have. And what is he going to do with it? He's going to worship Allah Azza wa Jal more. So subhanAllah, I mean, that makes this food ibadah for him. And when you eat and your intention, I want to use it for something that Allah loves, that, that time and that food that you ate becomes a worship of Allah Azza wa Jal. It's connected. It becomes part of it. Hmm? Where they will be, but... where they will be, Allah, I don't know, I don't know. I, yeah, no, can Allah, they they weren't like they didn't have our standards today, right? Where you have to be slim like that and have to fit these, you know, sizes. They didn't have that. So Allah, طيب, this is. Um, I want you to see his routine. This this is a routine that he had when he was in Mecca. So he came to Mecca, and was habit was that when he prays Fajr. He would sit to remember Allah Azza wa Jal until the sun rises. Then he would circle, right, seven tawaf circles around the house. For each one circle, he'd pray two rak'ahs that are very long. So, and then he continues to do this until sort of midday. So midday, I'm thinking maybe they mean maybe let's say like nine, ten, something like this, maybe. Then he goes to his house and he takes the mushaf and he starts to read. And maybe then he sleeps, or maybe he doesn't. And then when he hears the Adhan of Dhuhr, he goes to Dhuhr, he prays Dhuhr, then he continues to pray till Asr. Then when he prays Asr, the people of Hadith, the, the students, they will come, and then he will teach them and all of this, and he will discuss these issues with them until Maghrib. And then when he prays Maghrib, he will pray voluntary Salat al Isha. And then when he finishes Isha, he goes with Tawaf seven times around the Kaaba, and then he goes back to his house. If he was fasting, if he was fasting on top of all of this, he has energy. If he has fasting, he'll break, he'll eat, then he'll take the mushaf, and then he will read, and then maybe he'll read and then sleep. And then when the Fajr prayer, you know, is called, he will go out to the, maybe I think they mean the first Adhan. So he goes out and he will circle the house until the time for the Salatul Fajr. And that's his routine. And they said he did this how many days? He lived, lived in Mecca for a year, he lived this, did this entire year, right? So that's incredible ibadah, right? <laughs> that's incredible ibadah, right? So subhanAllah, you know, so this is how patient he was. Now, of course, you're not born like this. Huh? You climb to it, you ascend to this level. So if, if a person and if any of us is asked to do this, we'll collapse, we won't be able to, right? Our self, the, remember the rebellious self we talked about? That rebellious self will not let us do it because it's not used to it. But if you gradually start increasing your ibadah and you gradually come closer to Allah Azza wa these things become easier and easier for us. Until maybe, such a point, maybe you'll be able to do something close to this. Not that you have to do exactly like this, but something that is close to this, where you actually could sit for extended time Worshipping Allah Azza wa and not feel like why well, I'm bored or I'm tired or I'm just thinking about something else. No, you really are interested and focused and want, desire to do this. As a person says, he said, I saw a Thawri in a Masjid al Haram in Mecca after Maghrib and he was praying. So he prostrated and he put his head on the ground and he only raised it when. They called for Isha, right? And he's not doing this to show people. This is this his nature, right? That he'd be so consumed by what he's thinking about and Allah's worship and then just his dua and his fear of Allah. He put his hand forced to do. 
and he just gets immersed in it. And the time that he wakes up, you know, he's, he's reminded, oh, I need to raise, is when he hears the adhan. Then he raises his head, right? So this is, subhanAllah, a devotion that is not forced anymore. This is a devotion that is natural. Right? Otherwise, no person can actually put his head down for such long time uh, and pretend. Yeah? And he would, you know, subhanAllah, he would turn to uh, the young people. And he said, إِذَا لَمْ تُصَلِّ الْيَوْمَ فَمَتَى He would turn to the young, and he says, If you're not praying today, then when are you going to pray? So it's not that he's telling him, Oh, oh you have such a long time to pray. He's saying that now, why, why, by, by the way, why are you telling this to the young? What does that mean? If you're not praying today, now, when are you going to pray? Why is, he, why is he asking them that? What is it that you have when you're young? Hmm? Energy. You have energy and you have your health. You can stand. You can stand in when you're praying. You can circle. Right? You can fast. You can do the ibadah that requires, you know, physical energy. So it says, if you're young and you're not doing this, what are you waiting for? When you're old and you cannot do any of it? So if you're young, when are you going to And you're not praying, when are you going to pray then? When are you going to go to hajj? When are you going to fast? When are you going to worship Allah? This is the time that Allah had given you with time and energy for you to be able to do this. If you don't have the time for Allah Azza wa now, you may not have it later. And definitely the energy and definitely the health is not going to improve as you get older. So he says, if you have it, then Allah Azza wa wants to see. So you know that, Allah, that, that you're doing it and that you're using what Allah has given you. Now he also, this is we'll move on inshallah to, uh, to just talking about earning a living and having enough of it. He says, مَنْ كَانَ فِي يَدِهِ شَيْءٌ فَلْيُصْلِحُ فَإِنَّهُ زَمَانٌ إِنْ إِحْتَاجَ فَأَوْلُ مَا يَبْدُلُ دِينَهُ He says, if you have something like a source of income or a skill or whatever, use it. Use it and cultivate it. Because this is a time, and he's talking about his time, he says, this is a time when there, if, if you need, or if you need something, you need of money, you may have to sacrifice and compromise your religion. So, this is, we can take this and modify it and say, if there is an opportunity for you to earn halal income, seize it and take uh, advantage of it. Because this is a time where there is no a lot of opportunity for people to earn halal. Huh? So, if you have an opportunity to earn halal, and especially if it's purely halal and something that you're in control of and you cultivate it, you can expand it, then go ahead and do this. Especially if it's business. Huh? But not exclusive to it, but especially if it's business. And you're able to include others in it. And everybody is earning halal and everybody is able to be suffice, alhamdulillah, and they're supporting their families. Then you're doing something that is great in the sight of Allah Azza wa Jal. Earning halal and helping others to earn halal. Because it's at a time where people want, don't have enough money and when they want to go and earn, the opportunities are either haram or mixed. So that is valuable advice from him, rahimahullah. And he says also to another person, alayka bi'amali al-abtal al-kasbu min al-halali wal-infaqu ala al-iyal. He says, do the work of heroes, earning from halal and spending on your children. So he called that being heroic, uh, a hero, a heroic act. That you can actually earn halal. We call this jihad, remember? We call this jihad for the sake of Allah Azza wa when it is done for the sake of Allah. That you only go for the halal and you do this for the sake of spending on your children, spending on your parents, spending on people who need you, spending on those. So even, you know, they're not family, but they are righteous people and you are supporting. That is jihad for the sake of Allah Azza wa and something that Allah Azza wa loves, especially in a time when halal is not uh, greatly available. Inshallah, just a couple of sayings, inshallah, and then we'll start. He says, Rahimallah, he gives an example of the dunya. And he says, that dunya is like a piece of bread that has honey on it. And then a fly comes and lands on it, gets stuck to it, and dies because of that. 
But he says, if you pass by a bread that has no honey on it, you land and you fly without any damage. So he's saying that the richer the dunya is, what does it do to you? It traps you and it kills you. That's the dunya, you know, with honey. Although honey is good, right? But it's just using it as a, as a trap for the fly. So it traps you. So more of it, and dunya is very, very attractive. So it will pull you and keep pulling you until it destroys you. But if you don't pay attention to it, and you don't care about it as much, if it comes, it comes, alhamdulillah, use it in what Allah loves. If it goes away, you know that it's not the beginning or the end of things. And what Allah has is better. So it's like a piece of bread that has no honey on it. He says, you're light. You come in, you eat what you like, and then you leave. So it does not kill you. He says also, how much should you work for the dunya and how much should you work for the akhirah? He says, work for the dunya in proportion to the time that you're going to spend in it. And work for the akhirah in proportion to the time that you're going to spend in it. Now, is that possible? Huh? Can you? It's not really possible. right? But he's approximating. Because if you think about it, you're um, sitting or you're going to be living in the akhirah for what? Ever. That you can compare that, is if you want to take a percentage, to the dunya, forever next to what? 60, 70 years is what? That becomes nothing. Because this is forever and this is nothing. It means that you have to do, and you have to spend all of your life for the akhirah and nothing for the dunya. Well, that's not possible. You cannot do this. It doesn't work like that. But he is trying to approximate and you know, have this sink in our heads that you are staying in the akhirah forever. Your station in Jannah or, God forbid, in hellfire, that is what? Forever. So how much do you want to invest in forever? How much do you want to give it? You should give it most of your life. Most. So if you're able to do this, you're among the successful ones. Fortunately, humanity, what it does is that it reverses this. A little bit for the Akhirah. And that even we're complaining about. Huh? Why do I have to pay zakah? It's just so much. And then why do I have to come to the masjid and five salah? And then I know when you're yelling at your kids, pray, pray, pray. And it's just so difficult for us, right? To come and pray on time. And you delay it and you skip it. And you say, maybe I'll do it tomorrow. Maybe I'll do it next week. So, so little for the akhirah. Huh? And a lot for the dunya. Or there's a test tomorrow. Or you need to apply to this job. Or you need to be admitted to this university. You do everything that you can. Huh? You know, you don't sleep. You take, uh, I don't know, Red Bull or whatever. And then you just, yeah, you, you're completely focused on, uh, this is the dunya and that's what I want. Anybody, I mean, you shouldn't really drink Red Bull for any reason. But would, would you consider doing that for Qiyam? You shouldn't. You shouldn't for Qiyam. But like, it, like, it should be like, okay, if I'm drinking it for an exam, I should have been drinking it for Qiyam. But I'm never going to do it for Qiyam. If I'm lazy, I'm saying, okay, not tomorrow. If I'm sleepy, I say, okay, so I'll skip it today. But we won't skip an exam. We won't skip an interview. We won't skip anything for the dunya. So it's saying, consider how long and how short. How short the dunya is and how long the akhirah is. At least, at least they should be equal. At least let them be equal in your day, in your life. At least care about them equally. If not, subhanAllah, more for the akhirah than it is for the dunya. And last thing, inshallah, maybe. Uh, he says, we haven't seen um, zuhud in anything less than power or less than a riyasa, leadership. He says, we could see a person uh, disinclined. He doesn't care about money. He doesn't care about eating and drinking and fine, fine uh, luxury clothes. But when it comes to power, he fights for it. So it tells you also, subhanAllah, that power has an intensity to it. So a person could be disinclined, he could be subhanAllah, disinclined, and he's aware of his circle and the people that he's around, and this is something that he has seen. So a person may not care about money, might not care about, you know, but they care about fame. They may not care, for instance, about, you know, luxury clothes, they don't care about cars, but, you know, they have power. And if you challenge that power, they'll challenge you. So this is also a fitna and a temptation. And this is, inshallah, the last thing. He says, Al-yaqeenu an la tattahima mawlaka fi kulli ma asabak. And we'll just stop with this. Al-yaqeenu an la tattahima mawlaka fi kulli ma asabak. He says, certainty 
is for you not to suspect or accuse Allah Azza wa Jal when things when bad things happen to you. That's a certainty. Certainty that what Allah sends you is what? Hmm? What is it? Whatever Allah sends you is the best, is good, and is best for you. Even if in the beginning it does not feel like it is nice, even if it is bitter, and it's not what you wanted, and it's not something that you've always desired, but still if this is Allah's choice, if He decides I'm gonna do it this way and not that way, having yaqeen, certainty in Allah Azza wa means that you never suspect Him, and you never doubt Him subhanahu wa ta'ala. And by the way, this is something that needs to be developed. It's not something that I tell you about or I read about and I immediately have it or you immediately have it. You need and we need to develop it. And sometimes Allah Azza wa develop it, develops it for you by giving you something bad and you know, revealing to you later on the good things that are in it so that you discover for yourself, not somebody telling you that there is something good in it that you did not see. And then you begin to believe. Really begin to believe. I doubted before, but now I trust you. So the next time you give me something I dislike, or I do not understand, I have my previous experience to support me and tell me that I should continue to trust you. That is yaqeen in Allah Azza wa Jal. The more you have of it, the easier this life will be for you. Because whatever happens, does not matter. Follow me? Whatever happens, if Allah were to tell you, whatever happens is good for you. Would it matter what happens next? Would it? You wouldn't worry about it. Whatever is going to happen to you from now till tomorrow, whatever it is, is good for you. You're not going to worry about it tomorrow. So this is having yaqeen in Allah Azza wa Jal when it comes to your risk, what Allah provides for you, what happens with your family, what happens with anything else that you know gives you trouble or anxiety, whatever. If Allah, if you trust Allah Azza wa Jal, whatever is going to happen is the best for you. Then you will trust Allah. Inshallah, let me stop here. I don't know. Yeah, so we still maybe have a few minutes, inshallah. If you want to ask anything or add anything, let me know. You don't have to have, you can be rich and you can have things, but you can be humble in the things that you have. So for instance, if there is a, a thing that you could own that does the job um, just for uh, extended luxury or showing off or demonstrating your, your status to people. So if you live a humble life where you buy the things that you need and things that you like, subhanAllah, without anything, you know, you like something to, to be soft or you like nice food. You don't have to deny yourself. Huh? But don't go um, to a level where you're overspending, you're being wasteful, or also um, don't live or indulge in so much luxury that you cannot retreat from it whenever you want. So whenever you want, you buy yourself. Whenever you need, you buy yourself. Because it becomes then later on difficult for you to say, well, I want this, but I need to have it. You've, because you accustomed yourself to become a habit, that whenever I want something, I need to have it. And you haven't trained yourself and myself to be disciplined enough that sometimes I say, I shouldn't have this and, and not have it. So don't live in luxury or too much luxury, inshallah. And then don't let the love of this invade your heart. And know that you can lose it at any time. And then if that's the and then zakah and sadaqah. If that's the case, you can be rich. Uh, uh, about what, sorry? Yeah, no. That is fine, inshallah. So your question about, is it okay to ask somebody for help after, of course, I've asked Allah Azza wa Jal. And yeah, there's, we're not saying that there's anything wrong with it. And uh, there is, it's not, definitely, it's not like you're worshipping somebody else when you ask them for help. No, no, not at all. 
But definitely, this what we want to get from it, inshallah, is that the first one that we want to ask is Allah Azza wa Jal. And as much as you can attach yourself to Allah, that even when you're asking somebody else for help, He's also or only a means, sabab. And the one who controls this and the outcome of whatever this person can or cannot do is Allah Azza wa Jal. So don't attach yourself to anybody else. Always keep it to Allah Azza wa Jal. This way makes it easy. Easy like if you go ask for somebody for help and they refuse to help you, you're not going to be angry with them. Huh? Or if they fail or if they are not very attentive and responsive to your need, you're not going to be angry with them simply because you know that Allah is the one who's in control of all of this. And you don't really need them and you're not really reliant on them. You're just exploring who can lead you in the right direction and whom Allah Azza wa Jal is going to use to solve your problem. So if this person cannot, don't worry about it, right? So you're not, you're not going to have any ill feelings about what they're doing because it's Allah did not choose them to solve your problem. It's just somebody else who will do it. So keep, your, keep our hearts attached to Allah. Then of course it's fine to ask other people. We need the help of other people, of course. Right. So we're good on our sister's side. Brother Rafai? Yeah, inshallah. We'll see you next week with Ibnilla. Subhanakallah wa bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa an. Astaghfiruka atubu ulayhi. Alhamdulillah. Wa iyaakum. Wa zakkar.